Hello, this is Dr. Gardner. We'll be talking about some extra calculations to help you practice uh, stoichiometry with respect to limiting reagent problems, uh, theoretical yield problems, percent yield problems. We'll be applying those to some of the problems similar to your homework assignments to hopefully help you with some of the more challenging questions you might run into. So first of all, let's practice again uh, using an ICF table where we have the initial quantities of reactants, uh, how much they will change as the chemical reaction proceeds, and then a final concentration uh, for those reactants and the products that we form. So let's look at a combustion reaction. This is a combustion reaction of uh, ethane. It's a component of natural gas. It's a hydrocarbon because it has carbon and hydrogen in the fuel. When it combusts and combines with oxygen, we end up with carbon dioxide and water vapor uh, in what we call a complete combustion reaction. Now, I've given you gram quantities of two of the reactants. So I told you we had 0 0.240 grams of the fuel and 1.454 grams of the oxygen gas that it's combusting in. And we would like to determine how much of the reactants are used up because one is likely to be an excess and one's likely to be the limiting reagent and used up first. And in fact, whenever you're given quantities of two reactants, that should be kind of a uh, clue that this could be a limiting reagent problem. Likely one of those two reactants will be used up before the other. And so that's what we're going to have to determine. So whatever is the limiting reagent, we should end up with zero grams of it at the end of this process. And whatever is an excess, we'll have a small quantity of it left over and then we'll want to determine the amount of the products that have formed for both carbon dioxide and the water. So here's how I would set up this type of calculation. First of all, where I begin with gram quantities, I need to convert from grams to moles. Now if I had one of these tables that had mole quantities of everything and that's what we wanted, it actually is a simpler type of problem because in that case you don't have to convert to or from grams. Or if I had numbers of molecules, I just have to realize that I have to have whole numbers in that case for the numbers of molecules. I'm looking at and those are actually simpler calculations because I can relate the stoichiometric coefficients that are in front of each of my reactants and products directly to moles or molecules whereas if I have gram quantities I must first convert to moles so that's what I'm going to do first I'm going to convert to moles and determine how much of my product might form as each of my possible reactants might be consumed so if the full 0 0.240 grams of ethane were to react, we know that its molar mass, if we calculate it, is 30.07 grams of ethane for every one mole of ethane. Once I'm to moles of ethane, I can relate to the amount of carbon dioxide that could form. And I can realize there's a 2 to 4 ratio, stoichiometric ratio here, from the fuel to the carbon dioxide product. So two moles of ethanes consumed for every four moles of carbon dioxide that's formed. That's my uh, stoichiometric ratio, my molar ratio. Uh, once I've calculated the moles of carbon dioxide, I can convert back to grams of carbon dioxide because this table would like us to report everything in grams. So I calculate the molar mass of carbon dioxide and multiply that by that. So that's 44.01 grams of carbon dioxide for every one mole of carbon dioxide. If I check all of my units should cancel, except for the grams of carbon dioxide I was interested in. Now, this will give me a gram quantity of carbon dioxide that would form if all of the fuel combusted. And we're still not certain if that's a true statement. But if all of the fuel does burn, we'd end up with 0 0.703 grams of carbon dioxide. Now, we have another reactant, which is the oxygen gas. We have 1.454 grams of oxygen gas that could be the limiting reagents. I'm going to determine how much carbon dioxide would form if all the oxygen were consumed. Now one of these will be true and one of them will not. Whichever produces the least amount of carbon dioxide is my limiting reagent and that's what we predict to be the theoretical yield, the theoretical amount of carbon dioxide that could potentially form. Okay, so if I calculate the molar mass for oxygen gas, realize it's diatomic, so I need to use a molar mass of 16 times 2, so 32 grams of oxygen for every one mole of diatomic oxygen. And then I look at my molar ratios here, and I see that there's 7 moles of diatomic oxygen reacting for every 4 moles of carbon dioxide that's formed. So I have a 7 to 4 stoichiometric ratio, or a molar ratio. And then I multiply by the molar mass again of carbon dioxide of 44.0 one grams per every one mole of carbon dioxide and if all of the oxygen were to be consumed we'd produce 1.143 grams of carbon dioxide. Now we can't produce 
we can't produce both of these quantities. We actually produce the smallest. So as soon as we produced the first 0 0.703 grams of carbon dioxide, we ran out of fuel. So the rest of the oxygen wasn't allowed to react. It's going to be an excess. So we never get to this larger amount. So sometimes I like to put a line through it to indicate that I don't get a chance to produce this extra carbon dioxide. So my theoretical yield of what I would produce is 0 0.703 grams of carbon dioxide. And I know whatever reactant produced the least amount of yield of product would be my limiting reactant. So I like to draw an arrow back to remind myself it's the uh, reagent I begin with, the, the ethane C2H6. So that's my limiting reactant or limiting reagent. I could say that the oxygen gas was in excess or an excess reagent or I have extra left over at the end of this process. Okay, so now we have a little bit of information. We know that uh, we produce 0 0.703 grams of carbon dioxide is what we're predicting theoretically. We know we consumed all 0 0.240 grams of the ethane, the fuel, so I'm going to subtract that from the amount that I started with. So I end up with 0 grams of my limiting reagent. It should have been used up based on our theoretical calculations. We also know that we ended up having uh, 0 0.703 grams of carbon dioxide that would form if all of the fuel had combusted. So that's my theoretical yield I've put in here. So we've started to fill our table in, but we're not quite done. We also want to determine uh, how much water would be produced. So I do another set of limiting reagent calculations. So I calculate how many moles of my ethane again. And then I use a molar ratio now to compare the ethane to water. So for every two moles of ethane that reacts, I'm going to produce six moles of water. Then I use the molar mass of water of 18.02. Remember that's 16 from oxygen and then 1.01 .01 times 2 for the two hydrogens. So I get 18.02 grams of water for every one mole. And that gives us a theoretical yield of 0 0.431 grams of carbon dioxide. Now, if you don't believe me when I tell you that the ethane is still the limiting reagent for the other product, we can go ahead and double check that. Actually, this shouldn't be carbon dioxide. This should be the H2O there that we calculated in this case. So we have 0 0.431 grams of H2O. Uh, if we were to ch double check to make sure that we had set up our calculations correctly, we can see how many grams of water would form if all the oxygen had been consumed. So again, it's 32 grams per mole of oxygen. So I divide by the molar mass, convert from grams to moles of oxygen. Then I look at my molar ratios. For every seven moles of oxygen, we produce six moles of water vapor in this combustion reaction. So it's a seven to six ratio. And then I multiply by the molar mass of water to get the grams of water. And I predict then that if all the oxygen had reacted, it's still the excess reagent. I would have produced 0 0.7018 grams of water this time, not carbon dioxide. Uh, but I don't get a chance to form that 0 0.7018 grams of water because as soon as I form the first 0 0.431 grams of water, we ran out of fuel before all the oxygen could react. So I never was able to make this amount. So I'm going to predict that again, my fuel is still the limiting reagent, and that's what we would expect. Once you've first determined the limiting reagent, if you've calculated everything correctly, it continues to be the limiting reagent for any of our other stoichiometric calculations for that same reaction. Okay, the only way that could be altered is if we had begun the reaction with different quantities of the reactants. So it's still my theoretical yield is determined by the limiting reagent being the ethane. And my excess reagent is still oxygen, so that didn't change. So if you'd recognize that, you probably could have skipped this whole second calculation and just determine based on our previous calculations, the limiting reagent would have given me the limiting reagent for both carbon dioxide and water. So I could have just done one calculation here if I'd realized that. Okay, so let's go ahead and, and add some extra numbers to our table. So we determined that uh, my theoretical yield of water is the 0.431 grams. So I'm going to place that in my table here for my quantity of water that would form. And then I wanted to do an additional calculation to find out how much of the uh, excess reagent was used and how much was left over. Okay, so that's what we're going to do next. So I go ahead and... <coughs> 
compare my grams of the fuel that's completely combusted, I convert that to moles again. So I divide by the molar mass of the fuel to get moles of the ethane, C2H6. And now I'm going to relate my stoichiometric ratio of the ethane to the oxygen that it's combusting with. So I have a 2 to 7 molar ratio. So for every 2 moles of the ethane, the fuel, 7 moles of oxygen must have combined with it in the combustion process. <clears throat> then I'm going to multiply by the molar mass of uh, diatomic oxygen of 32 grams per mole. And I'll see that I would end up with having used 0.894 grams of oxygen. So that's how much was consumed at this point. Okay, so I can recognize then that I can subtract that from the original amount. So how much reacted was the 0.894 grams of oxygen when my fuel was completely consumed. Subtract that from the original amount of oxygen I begin with, and we'll end up with having an excess amount of oxygen that was left over of 0.560 grams. So at this point, we've done quite a few stoichiometry calculations. We've done some limiting reagent calculations, and we've completely filled in our table for gram quantities. For our next exam, you should be able to fill in a, a ICF reaction table with respect to gram quantities, mole quantities, or numbers of molecules. And you have practice for this on your homework as well as we've practiced several of these in our tutorials including this one. So go back and review those if you need some extra help and please contact me if you have questions. Okay, let's do a few more example calculations. Uh, let's consider this scenario. We're going to combust um, methanol here. So my methanol is wood alcohol, uh, much more toxic than grain alcohol that's known as ethanol. Uh, the methanol here that we have, we have 4.30 gallons of the methanol. And we're kind of curious as to uh, what's happening in this reaction as I take 4.30 gallons of the methanol and I give you a little information on like my conversion from gallons to liters is one gallon is 3.79 liters and the density of methanol is 0 0.793 grams per milliliter. Okay, We would like to know what mass of oxygen would have to be used to completely combust with this amount of ethanol. Now in this case this isn't a limiting reagent problem because we know uh, the amount of methanol and we just want to know how much of the other reactant that would have to be used to completely combust the methanol. So I only need to set up one stoichiometry problem here. Uh, the only difficulty is, is to do my stoichiometry problem, I need to convert from gallons to numbers of moles of the methanol. So I'm going to have to convert from gallons to liters, and then from my liters, I'm going to use my density value to convert to, uh, to grams after I convert to milliliters. So here's my setup. First of all, I'm going to go ahead and convert my gallons to liters. So I have 4.30 gallons. My dimensional analysis will show one gallon is present for every 3.79 liters. Once I have liters, I'm going to convert to milliliters. So one liter is 1,000 milliliters. We'll see that all of our units cancel except for milliliters. And this 4.3 gallons of methanol contains 16,300 milliliters of methanol for our fuel. Now if I recognize that my density equation is mass over volume, then we can recognize that I can solve for the mass in grams of my methanol that is being used in this reaction. So I go ahead and multiply both sides by volume, so I end up with mass is equal to volume times density. Now we can go ahead and use our value from our milliliters that we had just calculated, and we're going to have 16,300 milliliters of methanol. That's how many milliliters of methanol in the original sample. Now my density value that we were given was 0 0.793 grams per liter, so I'm uh, per milliliter. So I'm going to multiply by my density. I multiply by 0.793 grams of methanol uh, for every one milliliter of methanol, and so I'll see that my milliliters cancel. And I'll solve for my grams of methanol in this 4.30 gallons being 12,900 grams. Okay, once I have the grams of methanol, now I'm ready to set up my stoichiometry problem because I know I can convert from grams to moles by dividing by molar mass. Okay, so I start with my grams of methanol that we just calculated, the 12,900 grams. I'm going to divide by the molar mass of methanol. So I calculated the molar mass of methanol was 32.04 grams of methanol for every one mole. Then I'm going to use my stoichiometric ratio, my molar ratio from the balanced equation, and relate that 
from the methanol to the oxygen gas because our question asked us how much oxygen gas do we need to use to combust all of the fuel. So I have a 2 to 3 ratio for every 2 moles of methanol and I put the 2 moles in the denominator so it will cancel the moles, some methanol units. For every 2 moles of the methanol that reacts we also must combine it and react it with 3 moles of oxygen gas. So now we can see once I have the moles of oxygen gas, I can multiply by the molar mass of diatomic oxygen gas, which is 16 times 2, so that's 32 grams of oxygen gas for every one mole. We'll end up with receiving the number of grams of oxygen gas that would react, and so it's going to be 1.93 times 10 to the fourth grams of oxygen gas that would be needed in this combustion reaction. Okay, so really what's new here is we combine some concepts that we had before. We used dimensional analysis to convert our units of volume, and then we used our knowledge of density calculations to convert from uh, volume to a mass. Then once we had our mass, we set up a basic stoichiometry calculation, converting from grams to moles, used our molar ratio to convert from moles to moles, and then used our last molar mass to convert from moles back to grams of the other reactant. Okay, so be ready on our exam to potentially combine a few of the concepts you've been learning in the course for some of our more challenging questions. Okay, let's work another calculation. Let's look at the decomposition of calcium carbonate. So if I take solid calcium carbonate and heat it up, it decomposes to form calcium oxide as well as carbon dioxide gas, which escapes. So if I took a 15.8 gram sample of calcium carbonate and I heated it in an open container and it starts to decompose. This is a decomposition reaction because I have one compound forming several products. It's also a gas evolution process. I'm producing carbon dioxide gas. Okay, as I heated the 15.8 grams of the calcium carbonate, uh, we ended up with losing some mass. The mass of the remaining solid when we were done was 9.10 grams. We're told the reaction may or may not have gone to completion, so that 9.10 grams is going to have calcium oxide in it, but it may also have some rea unreacted calcium carbonate present. Okay, so we would like to calculate our percent yield of the carbon dioxide that was produced in this reaction. So the first thing I need to do is determine uh, what the theoretical yield of carbon dioxide that could have been produced would have been. And so I'm going to use the 15.8 grams of calcium carbonate. I'm going to go ahead and recognize that uh, I ended up with 9.10 grams of my product in the end. So I subtract the difference in mass and I find that I la lost 6.7 grams of carbon dioxide. That accounts for this mass loss. It must have been CO2 that was escaping from the decomposition reaction. Now this is my actual yield. The 6.7 grams of carbon dioxide that was produced in my experiment was the actual yield of this reaction. If I consider my theoretical yield, I need to think about, well, what if all 15.8 grams of the calcium carbonate was converted to calcium oxide? Let's calculate how much carbon dioxide gas would have been released. So I have 15.8 grams of calcium carbonate. I divide by the molar mass of calcium carbonate of 100.09 grams of calcium carbonate for every one mole. Then I recognize for every one mole of calcium carbonate, one mole of carbon dioxide would have formed. So it's just a one-to-one -one molar ratio, but I write it down to keep in good habits. Once I have the moles of carbon dioxide, I can multiply by the molar mass of carbon dioxide, which is 44.01 grams of carbon dioxide for every one mole of carbon dioxide. Now that's going to give me, in this case, the grams of carbon dioxide that I theoretically could have produced if this reaction had gone to completion. So I theoretically could have produced 6.95 grams of carbon dioxide. So I know my percent yield is not going to be 100% because my actual yield is not identical to my theoretical yield. Okay, so to calculate my percent yield, I need to take my actual yield divided by my theoretical yield and multiply by 100. So I take the 6.7 grams of the uh, carbon dioxide gas that I noticed was lost in the experiment. That's my actual yield. I'm going to divide that by the theoretical yield of 6.95 grams that I would have produced. Okay, And then I multiply by 100. It gives me a 97% uh, yield in this case. Okay, so that, that was a little bit tricky because you had to think about what was going on in the reaction in greater detail than in some of our previous problems. So I thought that might help you out uh, before you try to work a problem like that on the homework.
Now let's try another reaction. Now I have mole quantities I was given. So I'm told that I started with 0 0.30 moles of sodium metal and I begin with 0 0.60 moles of nitrogen gas and we ended up forming uh, 0 0.055 moles of Na3N. Okay. In this case, I was told the quantity that I formed in this reaction, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's the same as my theoretical yield. So I'm thinking about this as my actual yield of the product that was given. Since I was given quantities of both of my reactants, I'm thinking to myself, this could be a limiting reagent problem. So I need to determine how much of the product would form if either one of the reactants was consumed completely, then determine which was the limiting reagent and was used up first. That will determine my theoretical yield of the product. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, look at this reaction. What I want to find in the end is my percent yield, but if I have my actual yield and now I'm going to calculate the theoretical yield, I'd be able to calculate my percent yield. Okay, so first of all, I begin with the 0 0.30 moles of the sodium that I begin with, and I use my stoichiometric ratio that there's six moles of sodium that are reacting for every two moles of my product that are forming. So I have a six to two mole ratio. So I'd predict if the sodium were used at first, if it were the limiting reagent, I'd end up forming 0 0.10 moles of my product. Now I need to double check to see if this is the smallest amount of product that could form when the reactants are consumed, so I'm going to also calculate how many moles of product would form if the nitrogen gas were the limiting reagent. So I begin with the 0.6 moles of nitrogen gas that we begin with, and I look at the molar ratio, it's just a 1 to 2 ratio. So for every 1 mole of nitrogen gas that we consume, two moles of my product would form, and so if all the nitrogen gas were to react, we'd form 1.2 moles of the product. Now I can't form both quantities, one must be used up first in this case, and so I ended up using up all my sodium middle by the time I formed the first 0.1 moles of product, so that's going to be my theoretical yield, and so in this case, my limiting reagent was the sodium. My excess reagent would have been the nitrogen gas, and so I didn't end up reacting all the nitrogen gas, so I never got to the 1.2 moles of product, so I put a line through it so I don't accidentally use that number in any calculations. Now to calculate my percent yield, I'm going to go ahead and take my actual yield that I collected of 0 0.055 moles of product, divide it by the theoretical yield that I just calculated of 0 0.10 moles of product times 100. So I took the 0 0.055 moles of product that I actually collected in the lab, divided by the 0 0.10 moles that we calculated theoretically, multiplied by 100, and we see we have a 55% yield of product in when this reaction was performed. Okay, now let's consider the reaction of iodine reacting with an excess. So you notice I actually told you which reagent was an excess. We have an excess of hydrogen gas to give 0 0.30 moles of hydrogen iodide. Okay, so in this case, uh, we would like to know what's going on with the quantity of moles of iodine that reacted. So I tell you that there's a 26% yield in this reaction when we had collected the 0 0.300 moles of hydrogen iodide. So I'd like to back calculate to find out how many moles of iodine must have reacted. Okay, so I must take into account that I only received a 26% yield. So quite a bit of the iodine that I began with, I didn't have a chance to uh, react entirely. Okay, so if I recognize that my percent yield is my actual yield divided by theoretical times 100, I can see that my actual yield in this case was the 0 0.300 moles of the hydrogen iodide, so I plug that into my equation. Uh, and then what I did was I multiplied both sides by my theoretical yield, divided both sides by my percent yield. So I divided by 26 percent, uh, then I'm going to solve for my theoretical yield, which is my unknown variable in this case. So if I take 0 0.30 moles divided by 26 times 100, it tells me that my theoretical yield must have been 1.15 moles of hydrogen iodide. So we're kind of working backwards here a little bit. We started with the percent yield back calculated to find the theoretical yield, and from that I know my theoretical yield is the moles of hydrogen iodide. But once I know the moles of hydrogen iodide that we theoretically could have produced, I can determine the amount of iodine that we have begun 
begin with. So I'd go ahead and write the balanced equation for this reaction. Now I need to recognize that hydrogen gas is diatomic and that elemental iodine is diatomic. And so if I have one molecule of hydrogen gas react with one molecule of elemental iodine, I produce two molecules of the hydrogen iodide. So I have a one to one to two stoichiometric ratio in this case. So if I set up the stoichiometry problem, then I can recognize that if my theoretical yield were 1.15 moles of hydrogen iodide, and I have a ratio of 2 moles of hydrogen iodide for every 1 mole of iodine that had reacted, then we must have begin with 0.580 moles of elemental iodine at the beginning of the reaction. Okay, And so in this case, that's what we are wanting here to relate. Uh, now. We noticed we got a 26% yield, so we ended up with only 26% uh, of that amount of iodine reacting. Okay, now let's consider if we take magnesium. We're going to go ahead and heat it in the air, and it's going to oxidize. It's going to react with oxygen to form magnesium oxide. And in the strictest sense of the uh, definition of combustion reactions, combustion reactions are elements combining with oxygen. We can say here it's, in a sense, combustion of magnesium in oxygen to form the magnesium oxide. Okay, now when we reacted the magnesium, we ended up reacting the magnesium with oxygen, and as it formed the magnesium oxide, it gained some mass. It gained 2.90 grams in mass. Now, with that in mind, we have to think about where did that mass come from. That mass must have come from oxygen combining with my magnesium to form the end magnesium oxide. So I'd like to back calculate and find how many grams of magnesium must have reacted based on that. So first of all, let's consider this. If the rest of that mass at 2.90 grams came from oxygen, well then we can calculate how much oxygen must have reacted with our metal. So I have 2.90 grams of oxygen. It's diatomic oxygen, so I can convert from grams to moles. So I divide by 32.00 grams of oxygen for every one mole of oxygen. I, my molar ratio, if I consider about this reaction, uh, my reaction is my magnesium metal reacting with diatomic oxygen gas to form magnesium oxide. Now, magnesium oxide, magnesium uh, is an alkaline earth metal, so it has a plus 2 charge. My oxides are a negative 2, so I have a 1 to 1 ratio in that formula of magnesium metal to oxygen. Okay, so if I'm looking at this, I'd end up with having, in this case, two moles of magnesium reacting with one mole of diatomic oxygen gas to form two moles of magnesium oxide. Okay, so I can set up my stoichiometric ratio. I have a one to two ratio uh, with respect to oxygen to magnesium. So for every one mole of oxygen that reacts, I must have had two moles of magnesium to begin with. And I'm interested in the magnesium here because we were asked how many grams of magnesium reacted. Okay, so once I have the moles of magnesium, I can multiply by the molar mass of magnesium, which is 24.31 grams of magnesium for every one mole. And that tells me that I would have had to have reacted with 4.41 grams of magnesium. Okay, so this was a simple stoichiometry problem. It didn't involve uh, theoretical yield or percent yields, but I thought you might want to see how to work this one kind of backwards from the mass of what we had begun with and what we ended up with. Okay, so... At this point, you should go to your homework and continue practicing some of these questions, but I hope the examples I gave you today will help you with some of the more challenging questions you need to work. Have a great day, everybody.